Hello and welcome to New Mexico Rising. My name is Dan. On this week's show, we're going to try to get your student prepared for college. We've been hearing resoundingly from students and teachers. They're ready. All that and more right here on New Mexico Rising. Checking credit scores, browsing travel discounts, managing auto and home loans these days. Your mobile banking app can pretty much do it all. And according to a recent survey, nearly 80% of us check it weekly, and we're doing more than just simple transactions. Author and financial guru, Yanely Espinal, uh, joins us today with a crash course in making the most of digital banking and maximizing digital financial tools, and will try to help us save time and that precious money. Good morning, how are you? Hi, I'm so good, thank you for having me. All right, so with your book and social media platform, you, you'd like to help people learn about personal finance in a, in, in a pretty much fun and engaging way. So what are a few tips you could share to help us start our own path to uh, financial success? Yeah, I always say you have to start with a written money plan. Uh, and I think that this is this can't be overstated because so many people think that they can just manage some aspects of their financial lives in their head, right? That's called mental accounting. And let me tell you, it does not work. So what you really want to do is have a written plan that you can refer to and measure progress towards your goals. So something like the specific amount of money that you want to save this week or how much you want to invest this month uh, or even how much income you want to generate in the next year. Uh, writing this down and having a place to refer to it is really a, a strong start. And then you can extend over to digital tools and banking apps that can help you manage all of this different you know, um, money goals that you've set for yourself and just really create a little bit of balance there for you. And uh, using banking apps is pretty much, you know, that we use it for every day. So what, what are some of the things that could be going on beyond just like the general transacting? Yeah, I love this question because I do think there's this misconception out there that if you have your banking app on your phone, it's really just for banking transactions that you do on a day to day. But there's actually so many new features, things like financial health tools and travel rewards. There's so much more there. Discounts when you're looking to shop. So I do think that that's something that most people wouldn't consider to check that is available. Uh, but most of the common use cases for these apps are going to be sending and receiving money between friends and family, checking your credit score right in your banking app. Uh, paying bills. If you got bills, you can set up your payments right from the app. And then, of course, depositing a check. If you have a physical paper check, you can just take a picture of that and then that will get deposited right from your phone. So how can we use like an all-in-one app to help us save cash? You, you know, I think saving is one of the features that I, I personally prioritize and I think is a really helpful place to use a banking app because it's really hard to save money, right? We're wired to want to spend it. So I think if you spend all your money and then you forget to save, you won't get to it. But if you use automatic savings features, it will prioritize saving so that you don't have to. So with like, for example, Chase, if you're a Chase client, you can use Chase Autosave, which allows you to choose a specific amount of money and how often you want to move it from your checking account to your savings account. And that automatic savings feature just makes your life so much easier. And then of course, there's some newer features too. One that I like is pay in for. So you're scrolling through the app and you see maybe there's like a larger transaction that's bigger than you typically have your transactions in the amount of, you can click on that transaction and see if there's a pay in for option because that will allow you to break up that payment into four smaller amounts. So that creates a little bit of wiggle room in your budget. You know, it makes it a little easier for you to manage something like an unexpected expense that might pop up because you've freed up a little bit of cash for that. So how about the different generations? How is like using uh, digital banking tools uh, improve their health financially? Uh, I, I would say people probably assume, oh, older generations aren't really using these apps. This is more like, you know, the Gen Z and millennials type of thing. Um, but the Chase Consumer Survey actually shows that about 80% of consumers are using these banking apps weekly. So that's not limited to a specific generation or age demographic. We are all using these apps, which is great. But millennials tend to be, you know, using it with couples or with friends or with roommates and family members a little bit more often. And they will send and receive payments because because they're more likely to split their monthly expenses. So maybe they're splitting their grocery bill or they're splitting utility bills, or maybe splitting the rent payments or mortgage payments. So there's just certain types of features that are more likely to be utilized by millennials and Gen Z. Uh, but it's important not to assume that everybody's not using it because we are all taking advantage of these banking apps. 
Yeah, Natalie, thanks for joining me this morning. Where can we go for more information and learn about much uh, more about some of these cool apps? Yeah, if you want to learn more about how you can better leverage your banking app and take advantage of some of those financial health tools, you can go to chase.com forward slash mobile. Thanks for joining me this morning, my friend. Thank you. You know, we're just a few weeks away from the big spring break travel surge. Thousands of families across the country will pack up their kids and head to a warm, sunny destination. I'd go without the kid personally, but uh, <laughs> national travel expert Davey Sutton is joining us live from Nassau, Bahamas with tips on how to stay safe and enjoy our vacation this spring. Welcome to the show. How are you, my friend? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm struggling each and every day. But uh, when I see you <laughs> sitting out in paradise, I'm like, that's where I want to be. Can you tell us uh, a little bit? Where where are you? <laughs> yeah, you know, you should want to be here. I'm in Baja Mar. It's a gorgeous luxury resort property that has everything you could want and need for your Bahamas vacation. There's a beachfront water park. There is a wildlife reserve here. There is 45 bars and restaurants, and they even have the largest casino in the Caribbean right here on the property. The Bahamas has been in the news recently for like a travel advisory on local crime in the area. Uh, what's going on? Yeah, you know, it's level two advisory, which just means to you uh, advises you to have uh, use caution. Um, but it doesn't advise you against traveling here. And I will tell you, my plane ride here was full and I've I've been comfortable here since I've been here for a few days. Um, th there was a representative from the U.S. Embassy who just said that they aren't concerned about Americans traveling to the Bahamas. Uh, and it's remains a very popular destination for Americans. In fact, last year, uh, nine million people came to the Bahamas for their vacations to uh, uh, to enjoy their vacations. Uh, it's a place where they prioritize the safety of um, the travelers are here that are here. And so officials and tourism people in the industry all want to ensure that everybody is safe. Safety. Uh, what can you how can you ensure or help yourself uh, enjoy your vacation as much as possible and kind of keep some of the safety in, in mind? Yeah. You know, when we go to a vacation and to a destination like this, you want to relax and the problem typically is that people put their guard all the way down and they may do things that they may not normally do at home. And when you travel to a place that you have never been before and you're very unfamiliar with, it is recommended to uh, remain in the main tourist areas and beaches um, until you become more familiar with the destination, especially if you're traveling alone. Another tip um, is to avoid, you know, we love taking our pictures and um, posting on social media, but don't do that in real time. Uh, wait till you leave the location or that hotel and then post on social media for all of your followers and friends to enjoy. And one last thing, I always just encourage everybody to listen to their instincts. If something doesn't feel right, it's okay to pot, put, put, put on the brakes and take it slowly until you can comprehend what is going on with the situation and make the best move for you and your family. You also said for tourists to stay on resorts and, and, and beaches, uh, but many people are going to the Bahamas to do that anyway. Is that true? Yeah, you know, like I'm at Baja Mar and there are three luxury properties right here. And so they have spacious rooms with picturesque views like you see in the magazines. The star of the show is Baja Bay, which is the water park that has 24 water slides, luxury cabanas. They have a, a surf simulator, which, by the way, I participated in a few days ago, and I just had a blast on that. For the teens and kids, there is the game zone that has 50 uh, interactive games and virtual reality experiences. Uh, and then if you are looking for a slice of local culture, the national bird of the Bahamas is a flamingo. So they have Flamingo Key, uh, which is the sanctuary. And also you can participate in something really unique that is uh, Flamingo Yoga. Flamingo Yoga. I'm, no, it doesn't work. I was trying to go for a joke there, but it doesn't work. All right, Davey, where can we go for more information about this and how do we book our, our travel? Yeah, if you want to book your Baja Mar vacation, visit Bahamar.com. Davey Sutton, thanks for joining me this morning, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Eating fish on Friday has pretty much been a custom of those observing Lent this time of year. And as the Mardi Gras party season winds down, reporter Angela King has tips to kick your meals up a notch. 
If you're one of the many people who observe the Lenten season by eating fish on Friday, you're not alone. Almost half the people who attend church services at least once a month say they observe Lent. Lifestyle expert Marilee Kern suggests keeping it simple. She says consider serving fish such as salmon and cod. The Mardi Gras season is also right before Lent, so if you're entertaining on a meatless Friday or just looking for something delicious for everyday life, Kern suggests serving up some seafood like shrimp. Lori's products include premium fish fillets paired with chef-inspired marinades. The wild salmon seasoned grill and wild cod butter and herb are guaranteed crowd pleasers. And CPAC jumbo coconut shrimp and popcorn shrimp are not only delicious, but are easily prepared in the air fryer, oven, or deep fryer. These crispy, easy to make shrimp are perfect for everything from parties to meal planning. To learn more, you can visit CPAC.com and Maury's.com. Enter today for your chance to win a family four-pack of VIP passes to Kung Fu Panda 4 on Tuesday, March 5th at 7 p.m. in Albuquerque. This is an advanced screening, so you get to see it before anyone else. All you got to do is go to NewMexicoRising.com and enter today. In today's rapidly changing job market, you know, there's a debate between the value of skills versus degrees, and one might be more relevant than ever. So joining us is Doris Savron, Vice Provost at the University of Phoenix, to dive into this pivotal shift towards, you know, a skill-based hiring with her extensive education and curriculum development. Doris is here with insights on how this transition affects workers, students, and employers alike, and how education can redefine your career path. Welcome to the show, Doris. How are you? Uh, great. Thank you for having me. So what is the driving, like the shift towards skill-based hiring? We really saw a few years ago, employers struggled to find talent for open roles. And then the pandemic arrived and that intensified the struggle. So it created this motivation and shift for employers to think differently about how they're recruiting. And they started to focus more on the skills approach because there are jobs they uncovered that you could do if you have the right skills and not necessarily need a degree. Um, so in our career optimism um, study um, through the Career Institute that University of Phoenix has and has done every year for the last four years, we're noting that um, information as well from both employees and employers seeing that shift. So what are like some tips to help workers and adult students leverage their skills for career opportunities? Yeah, so I would say for individuals, whether they have a degree or not, first step is identify the skills that you already have. And you can do that by looking at past jobs, current jobs and really capturing the skills that you had to use to be able to be successful in those roles. Look at projects you've done, volunteer work you've done in your community. Um, if you're a caretaker, there's definitely skills you're using to help uh, do that. And then capture that into a digital profile like LinkedIn so that when opportunities arise, you have a shareable record um, that you can um, forward when those roles open up. Um, we'd say if you're in class, if you're a student, to pay attention to the skills being introduced in your courses. At University of Phoenix, we've created a profile so students can actually track in each course as they demonstrate skills. Um, that gets added to their profile, so then they're seeing in real time the collection of skills that they're earning as they move along, so that when opportunities arise, they can match those skills with the opportunities. And then finally, not everyone takes advantage of this, but take advantage of training and development that's offered by your employer, whether that's um, training on the job, mentoring, or whether they offer tuition benefits that you can go back and take courses or get a certificate or degree, um, take advantage of those because you'll be ready for future opportunities as they open. And for employers, what are some of the tips for retaining talents in this like changing workplace environment? So in the surveys we've done that I mentioned with Career Optimism and then Brookings Institute, employees do prefer to stay with their current employers as long as it's clear to them what opportunities they'll have in the future to grow into new roles. So first we, um, we suggest employers uh, look at every role and identify the skills needed for those roles. Um, and then create clear pathways. So if I'm coming in and taking this job today, what are my potential options for jobs two, three, four years from now where I can grow with the organization? And then we say capture that into a system. So track all the skills that you have from your employees you've already hired, along with all the jobs that you intend to open. And then look internally first at the data to see, do I already have somebody on staff that could potentially fill roles because they have skills? They have brought skills with them that would align to these open roles. And then the third piece is provide training and development opportunities. It is so much more effective and faster to move a current employee into a new role by training them than it is to go outside and bring somebody new into the organization from the beginning. 
Doris Average, thanks for joining me this morning. Where can we go for more information about any of this? Individuals can go to phoenix.edu uh, slash blog slash skills. Thanks again for joining me this morning. Thank you. Spot Bitcoin ETFs. Ever heard of them? They're making the news these days with the Securities and Exchange Commission approving some, of, some to be traded on the major stock exchanges. The floodgates have opened for all investors, including crypto and their profiles more easily. None of this is making sense. Well, here's an overview. We have John Hoffman, head of distribution and partnerships at Grayscale, the world's largest crypto manager here to kind of help us out and get us on track if you have no idea. Welcome to the show, John. How are you? Hey, Dan. Doing well. Thanks for having me today. Pleasure to be here. All right. I'm a Bitcoin fan. I, I got several of different types uh, or chunks of Bitcoin of different types. I used to have several full Bitcoins back when it started and I just used it on random stuff. So if I, I, I I'm, I'm a little sad if I didn't save them, I'd, I'd have a Tesla in my hand, in my uh, uh, parking huh. garage right now, but nope. All right, so what is first Bitcoin ETF for those new to this like type of investing? And why is it making the news these days? Yeah, so first off, congratulations on being a, a Bitcoin holder there and, and sounds like an early holder as well. Uh, so spot, Bitcoin ETFs. It's a lot of financial jargon there. Spot refers to uh, the current market price. Bitcoin is the world's largest cryptocurrency with over a trillion dollars in assets. Uh, and ETFs, those are exchange traded funds. So they're pooled investment vehicles uh, that trade on an exchange like a stock. So when you put that all together, spot Bitcoin ETFs uh, really make it simple, easy, and convenient to buy or invest in Bitcoin uh, right from your brokerage account. So probably uh, a little different than how you bought Bitcoin, Dan, uh, years ago. I get that little stair step in my my portfolio a little bit off of Bitcoin. I've been patient and paying attention to it. But uh, what are the uh, benefits of investing in Bitcoin in the first place, actually? Yeah, so I think your, your point around patience is a good one. We should have long-term perspective when we're thinking about this asset class. There's two predominant reasons why people are investing in Bitcoin today. One is around performance. Uh, so Bitcoin has been the best performing asset in the world over the last decade. Uh, so there's investors that are interested from a performance standpoint. And then the second is really about diversification, um, which means that you know Bitcoin tends to behave differently than stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate. Uh, and so investors are introducing Bitcoin to portfolios for diversification and performance reasons. And if people like the idea that Bitcoin is not tied to any government or and want to have their Bitcoin in their portfolios, uh, why choose to do it with an ETF? So you can certainly buy Bitcoin uh, the you know, directly. The challenge with that is you need to safe keep it, you need to store it, you need to custody it uh, in a crypto wallet or a hard drive. Um, doing it in an ETF you can invest directly from your brokerage account. So the same place you would invest uh, in common stock or other ETFs, uh, you could invest in something like GBTC, the Grayscale Bitcoin ETF. Uh, and again, it makes it simple, easy, convenient uh, to invest instead of having to do it directly and safe keep it. The ETF does that for you. Are there other ways to invest in Bitcoin? Uh, can you tell us about GBTC and how is it performing? So GBTC is the Grayscale Bitcoin ETF. Um, that's the symbol that it trades under. So GBTC is the symbol you can use to, to look that up. It's the world's largest Bitcoin ETF with over $25 billion in assets or investor capital. Um, it trades over $700 million a day on average. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in this. And it's been tracking the price of Bitcoin very, very efficiently uh, because, again, it simply holds Bitcoin. So when you buy GBTC, you are getting a slice of Bitcoin. And again, you can buy GBTC um, just like a stock, uh, you know, for, for between $40 and $50 a share, depending on, you know, its current trading price. And you can get that exposure right there in your portfolio. Well, John, thanks for joining me this morning. Where can we go for more information? Yeah, we invite you to visit www.grayscale.com. That's G-R-A-Y scale.com. Uh, you can subscribe to our research and more information is also there about GBTC, the world's largest Bitcoin ETF. John Hoffman, thanks for joining me once again this morning. 
Thanks so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. The SAT is evolving, and with it, the way students prepare for college. So today, we're talking with Priscilla Rodriguez, Senior Vice President at the College Board, about this new digital SAT. This innovative format promises more relevant and streamlined experience, reflecting the needs of today's students and realities of the digital age. From shorter, more engaging reading passages to personalized insights into AP courses and career paths. Learning how the digital SAT can transform college readiness, whether you're aiming for a two-year degree, a four-year university, or just exploring some career options. Pr uh, Priscilla is here to shed a little light on how this shift can help shape your future. Welcome to the show, Priscilla. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so why did the College Board switch to this new digital SAT format? So we've been delivering the SAT on paper for about 100 years um, and have been asking ourselves for the last five to 10, right? When will the time be right? When will it make sense to take this test digital as so many others have had done before? And really over the last kind of three to five years, we've been hearing resoundingly from students and teachers, they're ready. Students are doing a lot of their living digitally. They do a lot of their learning and other testing digitally. And they were telling us more and more that having to take a test like the SAT or the PSATs on what they called kind of that scary bubble answer sheet with the number two pencil that you had to bubble perfectly was genuinely a source of stress. For today's students, it feels a lot more natural and a lot less stressful to take a test digitally. And we wanted to essentially catch up and, uh, and bring them the SAT the way that I think will leave them feeling more confident. So what can students expect on this brand new digital SAT? A few things I'd love to share. So the first is it, it, it's digital. So students are going to take it on a digital device, namely uh, a tablet or in um, a laptop um, using a student testing app we developed at the College Board called Blue Book, which they can uh, download in advance, get familiar with, and even do practice tests on. While this is a digital test, I do want to make sure students and families know you still take it in a classroom with other students and a proctor present. So this is not an at-home SAT. Um, and there are a few key changes that I want to make sure students know about. They really receive these well as we've been out um, piloting and studying and researching. So the first is the big one, which is that the digital SAT is significantly shorter than the paper SAT. Specifically, it's about two hours uh, long as, comp as compared to three hours for the paper SAT. Not only is it about an hour shorter, but students have more time per question on the digital SAT. They're telling us they feel less rushed during the test and less exhausted after it. They leave feeling more confident that they were able to show their best work in reading, writing, and math. A second um, change that I'd love to talk about for just a minute is within the reading and writing section. So with the paper SAT, the reading and writing section is made up of nine long reading passages, and each reading passage has a set of questions tied to it. As a student, if you don't understand or connect with one of those reading passages, you're risking five to 10 questions on the SAT. We heard that was stressful. And in this transition to digital, we decided to break it up. Every question in the reading and writing section has its own, still complex and interesting, but discrete reading passage, one question tied to it. Doesn't make sense to you, you flag it for later, you keep moving, and at most it's cost you one question. And then the third uh, and last one I'll mention is that in the math section, we um, are making it possible for students to use a calculator throughout the math section. And specifically, we've built in a great graphing calculator into that Blue Book student testing app. We wanted to make sure there was equitable access for all students to a high quality graphing calculator. So how can students practice for like the digital SAT? We want students to walk in confident and clear on what to expect on test day. And the best way to do that is to download that Blue Book student testing app in advance, get familiar with it. And inside of it are four full length official practice tests. They look and behave exactly like the real thing. And they give students back practice test scores and diagnostics, right? What are the skill areas in reading, writing and in math where students are strong? And wh what are the skill areas where they do have room to refresh and improve? From there, students can move over to our partner, 10 year long partnership with Khan Academy, another nonprofit organization where they can do um, skill building videos, tutorials, practice questions in those skill areas that our practice test showed they still have room to improve. And many colleges are already like test optional. So why should students even take the SAT? It's a good question. So we're four years, right, post uh, that spring and summer when colleges largely went test optional in 2020 because of COVID. And many remain so, at least for now. 
Um, nonetheless, we still have 1.9 million students taking the SAT in each graduating high school class. That's not uh, much less than how many students we used to have taking it back when it was required by almost every college and university. So why is that, right? I think it boils down to the fact that students and parents recognize that the SAT is a standardized measure of core reading, writing, and math skills. In a country where we have 25,000 high schools, they have their own course offerings and grading policies, colleges can't know all those schools. They can't understand what a transcript means necessarily from all of them. Providing an SAT score when you feel it's a good measure of what you've learned in high school can really give colleges helpful information to make sense of your high school GPA and transcript and put it in a picture with everything else you're submitting um, so that you can kind of put your best foot forward as you apply. The second reason that I think so many students keep taking the SAT has nothing to do with getting into college and everything to do with paying for it. So the PSATs and the SAT open the doors to over $300 million of scholarships for students every single year. We know families across the country are genuinely worried about how they're gonna pay for college. Taking the PSATs and the SATs can, can help open those doors and connect students to scholarship dollars to make college a possibility for them. Priscilla, thanks for joining me this morning. Where can we find more information about the digital SAT? So students and families who wanna learn more, get started on practice, or even register for an upcoming SAT can go to SAT, dot college board dot org backslash digital priscilla thanks for joining me this morning thank you appreciate it demand for online health and wellness has increased in popularity during the last few years and appears the trend is here to stay especially when it comes to online mental health care and a recent study shows that gen zers and millennials are experiencing mental health struggles more than older generations ava weeks has more Gen Zers and Millennials are struggling with their mental health more than older generations, according to a new study commissioned by Redbox RX, a telehealth and online pharmacy provider. The study of more than 2,200 U.S. adults conducted by Morning Consult found that 41% of Gen Zers and 36% of Millennials report more mental health struggles in the past year compared with 21% of adults 45 and older. While nearly 75% of Americans have struggled with mental health in the past year, only 37% with consistent or worsening mental health struggles have sought professional care, such as therapy or prescription medicines. According to the survey, Gen Zers and Millennials more frequently experience loneliness and failure to achieve life goals, stressors that are linked with worsening mental health. At Redbox Rx, we offer quick, easy, and discreet access to healthcare professionals who can treat a number of mental health conditions and prescribe medication that is shipped directly to your home. To learn more, visit redboxrx.com. And that is it for New Mexico Rising. You know, each and every week I try to bring people from across the country to come hang out with me, talk to you guys about cool things we can do right here in New Mexico. If you actually want to be on the show, just email me. That's newmexicorising at gmail.com. And if you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, just look up New Mexico Rising TV. And if you go to our website, newmexicorising.com, this week there is a chance for you to sign up for a family four pack of VIP passes to Kung Fu Panda 4, where there's a special screening this Tuesday night. They're VIP seats, so you're guaranteed in. So go to our website. Until next week, that was New Mexico Rising.